Uh, hello, this is David Birch at Sarpath School of Navigation with uh, sort of an experimental video because what I want to do in this video is go over a talk that was presented at the Portland Yacht Club here March 11th and it had to do with uh, sailing on the ocean route from Astoria up to points north. And this, are, this talk, uh, the slides and uh, the links and everything are actually online at, in, in our blog post and I'll put a link to that in the description to the video. So in a sense this video is just to show you what's there and if you see any uh, points of interest that might interest you and you want to follow up on, then you can come back and go to the blog and uh, track down the details with the actual links. And I'm just going to highlight a few of these points. So here, if I look at this trip, here is Astoria, Portland area, Portland, Oregon. That's a Washington, Oregon border. And so the idea is, it, is to discuss this route that comes out the, out the Columbia River and up here, and then back in the Strait of Juan de Fuda to Victoria, or on up maybe, uh, that's, there's a race like that, the Oregon Offshore every May, and then, I believe every May, and then uh, there is, um, or you might be going up here to sail for cruising uh, uh, to the Barclay Sound area. So that's a, that's the route we want to discuss, or that's the, it's the weather and navigation of that route that is the subject to this talk. The talk was about an hour, and I certainly am, I'm just going to quickly go through that and, uh, and show you what, what was covered, and then you can follow through as you see fit. So the, here's the two books we have for reference, the, um, the, uh, our weather book and our navigation, our new book actually on electronic charting. And that book you can, I'll just mention, if you happen to, uh, if you happen to be in the, in the Starpath neighborhood in the next week or so, this book actually has a promotional sale at 50% off using that code. And this book talks about uh, electronic uh, vector charts, vector charts, not the regular raster ones, but and we'll see, and, and it came up many times in this talk about the virtue of these kind of charts uh, for not just ocean sailing, but for all of your sailing, racing, and cruising. So the first issue always in such planning is uh, how far is it and how fast is your boat? And uh, so this trip is about 150 up to Nia Bay with the mouth of the Straits, 153, and then about 55 more on into Victoria. So a little over 200 miles when you figure tacking and so forth. So that's the first thing to be considered. So we're dealing with two days of weather forecasting. And generally, two days is pretty good. 48-hour forecast, pretty good data usually. We have, and, we'll, and it comes up here, we have some very good local data if you have a satellite phone or some way to get it when you're in the ocean. And there is, uh, there is some rumors that you have some good uh, Verizon uh, cell phone along there. Well, I'll come back to that. And there's a link to the ocean race. Uh, but then the next issue, look here at the next issue. The big issue, and we'll discuss both factors here, um, are you doing this route as a race, which means you have to start on a particular day at a particular time, or do you get to choose when you go? And that makes a big difference in your planning and how you approach the whole thing. And we'll see where the references for both of those come into play. So what's this? The reality check. Okay, so the first reality check here is that it could be perfectly calm water out there and 10, 10 knots out of the northwest or something nice like that or out of, right out of, on the beam from the west and you run right up there and it's no issue whatsoever. But you cannot count on that, not at all. Could be 50 knots out of the southeast. It could be pea soup fog the whole time. So you have to treat this as an open ocean voyage. And primarily so because along that river, even though there's several places that it would look like on the chart that you could stop, many of these places in bad condition cannot be entered. The bars could be closed. And um, this is a report that you can get online. Here's an example. Now, this happened to be the day we were out there, and they had real, the day of the talk, and there were a lot of these bars were closed. You just simply couldn't get in there, restricted, closed, etc. But this tells you, these are the online links about the real bar. Look at that. It must be some strong wind out there right now. All these bars are closed. So that link's in there, and you can come back to that. There's another nice link here, very good link here, 
which is a PDF, which is put out once a year by the Coast Guard. And it's the same just about every year. These things don't change very much. And they go up and down the coast for each of these dangerous bars, each of these places you might want to go that looks like you could perfectly just drive right in there and go. These are the ones that get closed when the surf, when the when there's a big swell coming in here and some current running out of here. These are dangerous, unpassable conditions at the bar, and that those bars can be closed. And the areas, and you can look at the charts. Let's just see here. Let me just uh, go back. Where do I want to go here? And let me zoom in here to one of these places. Um, Okay, let me just see. Okay, here's Astoria. You see this this dashed line right here. This dashed line here, here to here. That's the restriction area. And if you read, if you go and read that restriction area, let's just see. They even tell you where it is. If I go to properties, restricted area, uh, this is it, 165.13.25. And you can read that in the CFRs. Um, I don't know if I have that linked exactly. I'll, I'll double check. And if not, I'll add it. But this is a place where they can just flat close you out. The Coast Guard can just tell you you can't go in there. It's not, you can't go in there. Uh, you can't go across a bar. And that's the restricted area. And each of these areas, you see that dashed line right there. That's the dashed line where they can close out this area. So generally, if you get stuck and you need to go in there, you hang out here at this sea buoy one of these sea buoy here somewhere and wait and so forth. So the, all that information is described in this very nice uh, booklet that you can get uh, from the Coast Guard. And that's a link there about these uh, hazardous bars. Here's the other, just in passing a quick note. It used to be going up and down this coast. This was our uh, away point. This is the, off of Umatilla Reef. That's right here. Uh, Umatilla Reef sticks way out there off the westernmost point of the country here. Out here. Well, I'm not going to, I don't want to spend, I'll come back to, let's see, where is Umatilla Reef? I think it's right there. But anyway, so there used to be a buoy out here. But now that buoy, for some reason, is not there. So that's why it's important to use uh, modern charts and uh, not count on something that you may have seen when you were there 10 years ago. Or five, in this case, just five years ago. Four years ago, excuse me. Okay, then here then is one more note. This is the subjects that came up in that talk, and you can track them down from this article or from uh, reading the book about it. This shows the, the value in this... Um, let me see if I can find that again. These electronic charts... Uh, these electronic charts let you set a safety contour. You have to go in and uh, just read about that, and 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 you um, on the electronic charts you can set a safety contour where you're going to have a big prominent color change here. Furthermore, you can set up these to set an alarm when you're tracking your GPS boats tracking along here. You can set it up so if you start like your course over ground predictor is pointed towards this, and you have it set for like two hours ahead or one hour ahead or something, it'll actually alert you if you're going to cross that contour. And it turns out that if you if you go up and down this coast and play with that, and you would do the same thing going along any coast, you would do it. But in this case, not, not 60 feet everywhere, but in this case, 60 feet is... Uh, you know, you may not want to go that close, or you could squeak in a little bit in some cases, but it's a good visual reminder when your charts, when your boat's coming up the track like this, right? You want to just be aware, a big, big, bright aware that everybody on the boat can understand that this is, you don't want to go inside this line without, uh, without real being very careful. So that's another virtue of these electronic charts, use being able to, uh, Draw those where you want to, uh, and then uh, set warnings on them. Now, a quick check to the time when now you're not racing, but you want, or you're planning the race and so forth. But if you want to look at the climatic data, the very best climatic wind data is from this place, Kogal. And uh, that's a university that's in Oregon State University, I believe. 
And you here's the here's the link, and this is always worth checking out. If you don't know about this, it's worth it's absolutely worth knowing about that. You can go to any place in the world, and then you click here, and then as you move along here, close. Wait a as you move along here, you see the statistics for the wind. And you got twice a month. So this is May, February, March, April. These guys are going May, towards the end of May, I think. And it's also actually, I have to go back here, up in this region. And so you're here. And then you would go to May, March, April, May. And now you can then um, start looking. Oh, I missed it again. How did I do that? How I'm trying to go fast and I don't work very well going fast. Okay, now I go here and click that. Okay, so now you see in May, in May here, so now you can see the statistics you see along here. That's basically northwest, uh, you know, almost equal intensity around the northwest quadrant. And uh, and as you screw, as you move your mouse up and down the coast here, you can see what the statistics are. The wind changing. This is the very best climatic wind data that exists. Period. And so uh, no more coast pilots or Navy atlases or one thing or another. This is a place to get the best data, but I'm not going to elaborate on that right now. But that's called COGAL. You can check it out right there. So here's what now for the weather, folks. These are just the notes about the sort of sort what you have to work with when you're underway. You have voice reports. You have text reports, you have maps you can get, and then you've got the model predictions that you run as a grid files. Then you have your official observations, the buoy reports, the station report, the ship reports. I'm going to discuss that. We have a trick way to get ship reports. You can get satellite winds from the, from the ASCAT uh, scatterometer data. And then you have satellite photos. And uh, that'd be a little bit special that that's useful. Then, very importantly, you have your own observations. Now, uh, even on a 48-hour period, when uh, that's just 48 hours, you're out there. But um, in a changing condition, your own observations will help you judge the timing of the forecasts. So you've got your barometer, the wind speed, wind direction, sea state, and clouds. Mainly these three, in a sense, are the most important here. And it's not just the absolute values. You care about the absolute values of these, but you also care about how they're changing. So you want accurate calibrated instruments in all cases, and you want to log not just the wind direction as the west. You want like 275, 280, you know, whatever it is, and keep track of that. So you can see the first indication of the wind backing around. The bad weather is going to come in when the wind starts backing around from the northwest quadrant heading back to the south somewhere. These notes are there and in the marine weather book. So what we didn't get to cover in this course, uh, I mean in, this, uh, in that short talk, was how you evaluate the maps because you have to make decisions based on the forecast that you see. And uh, then that forecast, though, is a little bit different for this inland waters on the coast. If you have a satellite phone, you can get some updated data that's very good. So these comments here pertain mainly to uh, when you're further offshore, heading to Hawaii or across the Atlantic or someplace like that. Then you have to evaluate all the forecasts because... And here's our reminder, there's always a forecast and they aren't marked good or bad. We have to judge that ourselves. But on this coastal route, if you have a satellite phone, then there's model data that you can get that's updated every hour. And it's going to be very difficult, no matter how smart we might be, to outguess, uh, to do better than what these uh, hourly uh, high-resolution uh, rapid refresh models telling us. And I'll come back to that. Uh, well, we're going to come to that. So here then are some, just, and I'll leave this. These are things that we've built over the years for mariners that helps mariners with weather analysis and planning. Uh, this, and I'll just let you look at these. This, the, oh, I can't click that. That's the picture. Oh, that's not it either. Okay. Uh, I'm not 
so checked out on this. But anyway, here, oh, the links, oh, that's right. These are the pictures that were in the talk. These are the links now that make you, make, let you go in and check it. So this is, uh, this link here then is showing you all sorts of really nice resources for the, uh, for weather forecasting in the Pacific Northwest. All these zones, you can just, you can just click these zones and get the text reports and so on. So that's a real handy. This is another page. It's called our Transpac page. And this is a similar weather for the ocean. So it's all the data for the live updated data for the Pacific Ocean and, uh, and so forth right there. And also, actually, while I'm here, this is a good place to show. We've also made this com compilation of all the scatterometer data for the Pacific up there. And you see this. You don't get data all the time, but when you get it, it's real data. These are the satellite passes of the wind. And you have to look at other articles that we have online that explain how to use this in the primary resource. Again, this is just a quick survey to show you what's here. And then this is, uh, this is an article that tells you how to compile all the resources you need when you're underway. Then we come back to the issue. You could maybe get by, the, like I say, the, I've had people say that they have really good Verizon, Verizon cell phone coverage along this route, but I wouldn't want to, it's a big deal planning all this and doing that. A lot of people and a lot of expense involved. You might, I think you'd want to have a satellite phone, a satellite phone to get the data. And that's the safest way. This discusses some of that, gives a lot of links about it. There's also, uh, right. We've got some other links. And this talks about the mode, uh, some other places to get data. Now, I'm going to talk about what data you want in a second. Now, here's the one thing, though, that we did. We made this sort of compilation picture that shows that you do have VHF coverage, VA, uh, NOAA weather radio, all along the coast. So all along that route, you will have the NOAA weather radio. So you'll have the text from the VHF reports, and up in here you start picking up some Canadian reports. So that data is there, and uh, that's explained. So you have that, but that's not uh, really tactical. You know, that'll help you. That's a bare minimum, but ultimately you need to get this forecasted wind field so that you can make the real planning from. And this, what's this? We made this. This shows you where you can go look up this data we made this picture from. Now, then th here is a very nice, and I'll just mention this. You can go get it right from here. It's a PDF, a big long, this is only a corner of the page, but a very nice resource for anyone sailing into Canadian waters. It tells you where all the stations are, whether they're lighthouse buoys and so forth, what the order of their broadcasts are, what information they have, what frequencies and so forth. So you get that Marine Weather Guide Canada, click that button. Okay. Oh, we have another link too. Here's another. Let's see if that works. This is a page we made when we were doing our own courses going up and down the Inside Passage. We used to go uh, twice a year up to St. Petersburg from Seattle taking students on navigation weather training routes. And this is the weather page we made for them, starpath.com Inside Passage. Really a lot of valuable information there. So you can check that out. Okay, going on down, and then here's a sort of the minimum backup we always discuss for any ocean trip. It's a shortwave receiver. You get the high seas report, high seas and detailed coastal reports uh, four times a day. I think it's uh, like 3.30 and 9.30 a.m. and p.m. Yeah, 3.30, 9.30 a.m. and p.m. in the summertime, in the summertime. That's a different in the winter. So this is a way to get the high seas reports. Now you can get those reports by text, and that's we're going to discuss that in a moment. You can get all those reports by text, and that's a lot easier. When everything's working, you would get this by text. So this is just like a deep backup. So you get one of these radios, have some batteries for it, a 50-foot piece of wire for an antenna, put it in a double plastic bag and put it away, and you might you and if you need it, you got it. So that's that. 
And then here is, uh, now then we just mentioned a couple like trick plays where you can get some live updates underway. One is a dial a buoy. If you know, you can look up these buoy numbers at this link here, that link right there. You look up the buoy numbers along the route and then you can call that phone number and you can get the data if you have a cell phone or satellite phone working. Again, you can get all this by text much easier if everything else is working right. So here we're back to things not working and all you have is your satellite phone or cell phone working. Then you can get these live reports. The other trick play is this one, which is a really powerful trick, and I'll have to make a separate video on that. But if you go there and look, it's a way that you send your latitude and longitude free to ship reports at starpath.com, and then we mail back to you every ship report within 300 miles of you within the past six hours. And it's a way to get sort of live data from uh, points that are around you. And that, and then here's a video about the dial a buoy. Then one last thing that we showed here, this is, um, this is our briefings page. And um, so here, this is a page, okay, now that just tells about it. You actually download the real briefings from this page, like here's the Pacific briefing. I should open that up. Now this is a this is an interactive PDF. You can just download this PDF and for Atlantic or Pacific, put it in your phone or in your computer somewhere, and then this way you can either look at the maps either straight from uh, straight from the internet. Uh, that's if you've got an internet connection, then you're looking at these uh, these maps right there. Or, but these are big files. Or you can, uh, if you click this button, it'll actually generate. Let's see if that's true. It should uh, request from say ah, uh, not, not linked up here. This will actually generate the email for you to request that same map from. Um, uh, from sale docs, which will reduce it to about what's this 14k. So these are this is a very important, very useful page to look at. It's organized and, and so forth. So that's called our Pacific briefings. There's also Atlantic briefings. Then here is uh, this is now there's a this is just a summary. Now we're getting down to how you're going to really work with the weather, and and. We we want to look at the models, the model forecasts, or the or the uh, digital database uh, predictions here, and you want to look at these uh, in a computer where you can do some kind of tactical analysis uh, on the way up the coast or across the ocean or across the sound, as far as that goes. Um, and this is a summary of the model of what's available, what's available. And that's in an article. And so there's a link, one of these links here discusses these different models and what's available. The one that's going to be the most useful if you can get your, if you have your connections, is this HRRR model, which is updated every hour, has very high resolution data, and uh, it goes out 18 hours. It, it only forecasts 18 hours, but uh, you just come come back to it every couple hours and get the updates. So whenever anything changes, they change the model and change the forecast. So that's a pretty good one to look at. And for this trip, that's your primary. Uh, that probably be your primary source of wind data. Now then, here then, and then this is important. This is a, where the best source for getting those once you're underway in your vessel. That's saildocs.com. And then here, this is the important line. All this other stuff is written down somewhere in their writings. But how to get the HRRR, this somehow is not advertised and not uh, in their drop any of your drop-down menus. But if you try this sentence right here, or then modify it for your own needs, and you have to, you have to go get this document here, info on sale docs, that tells you how to request them and what these various coded symbols mean here. But you send that mail and then it will send you back that data which will then open up in one of your grid viewing uh, programs or your e-chart program. Every e-chart program will display this wind data just about overlaid on top of it. And look, this mail is requesting all these five models at once. You wouldn't do that. I just did that for simplicity here. You would normally have just one of these and maybe some other stuff, maybe ask for C state or something. But that's just to show you where you can get that. Uh, that's uh, 
valuable. And what do we have here? Um, oh, this is interesting trick play. Now suppose you don't have any kind of e-chart program or expedition or any kind of way to do analysis of the winds or optimal routing with your, uh, with your polar diagram. Suppose you don't have that, but you just care about knowing what the very best winds are. Then you want to look at the options you get from sail flow. Sail flow will give you the HRR data, right? They'll give it to you. You can get it online. And online, though, on the computer, on the Internet, you get just the re most recent hour. But rather unusually, if you download either the iPhone or the Android app, then you can actually go and get this HRR data I, you can't say anywhere in the world it's American data from U.S. waters, right? But for any U.S. waters, coastal waters and inland waters, you can actually get this data for all 18 hours on their portable apps for like a tablet or a phone. So that's worth checking out and check out the apps and... Um, Maybe we need to later make a little video. You have to uh, click the few buttons in the right order to get to that data. But you want the HRR model data. Okay, then let's see what else did we have here. We, we made a plug for a really nice uh, a Mac, Macintosh, uh, Grib Viewer, and Downloader program called LuckGrib. Dot com. You can look at it here. It's only for Mac. It's for Mac people only, but it's a very powerful tool. They also have the HRR data. This this app costs twenty dollars, but once you have it, then the data is all free, and you just download it. And here is just something interesting to show the difference between um, the HRR data, three kilometer resolution. That's the wind data there. Right? That's how that's the wind that's a resolution of the wind data in the, this model. Whereas if you go to the normal global model, it looks like this data is pretty good here. You see these little arrows everywhere, but they're not those aren't real arrows. Only look carefully, there are little dots on that one, little dot on that one, little dot on that one, and that one. Those are that's the real density of the data. This stuff in here is interpolated. In short, for coastal waters like this, you just can't use this GFS model. It's just not, not detailed enough. You need, to, you need to see what's really going on here with a high-resolution model. I'll leave that to, to pursue that. That's just it. Then the other thing, we made a plug, of course, for this program, Expedition, at Expedition Marine. That's the, uh, uh, the popular one amongst uh, competitive racing sailors, I would say. And it has uh, ways to put, you put in your polar diagrams, or you customize your own polar diagrams, or you take and measure your polar diagrams with your own boat underway over a period of time. It takes a long time to do that. But then you have polars, and then with your polars and the predicted wind fields, it will actually route your boat through the best route uh, through the wind as the wind evolves. That's uh, Expedition Marine. There's other programs that do it, uh, but this is this is one of the leading ones. We'll have later some articles on um, different options, but that's that one. And here, just to show, this is now a grib field of some currents. Now, normally currents are, are not a factor, particularly along this race, not in any dependable way of this route. But there is, there are these things called mesoscale eddies, mesoscale current eddies. They're just kind of like loose cannon batches of strong current. And these models will predict those currents. You can't count on this. You can't count on it being really there. But if they have a forecast of that, and it's a persistent forecast of that, and furthermore, there's more than one model. There's a HICOM model. There's a RTOFS model. There's even NCOM. There's OSCAR. There's three or four different ways to get current predictions. Some are predictions, some are averages over the past, uh, past eight or nine days, like Oscar and so forth. But if you see such an eddy that, or such a pattern that's there, you can't be guaranteed the current's going to be there, but you should be aware that it might be there. It could well be there. And if you see it and you have a prediction of what the pattern's like, you can make some tactics around it, avoid it, get in it, get out of it, whatever. But you have to really test it with your own measurements. You 
You can't just rely on, say, it's there, therefore I'm going to avoid that and go here or something. could be totally different. It's just for awareness, and then you measure it. Then you measure it. And then here we have an article, a rather long article online that talks about ocean currents. Let's see if I go there. Yeah, there's, uh, there's about ocean currents and model predictions and a bunch of links and things like that. Um, let's see, where is my article? Well, maybe it's here. Oh, okay. So where are we now? And then one other thing very interesting that we brought up here at the end that in certain parts of the world, and, and this is sort of almost for like a information section because unfortunately these current, this current data doesn't exist for the route that of interest of this talk, namely coming from here and going north. It only exists from here going south. But these are real, H, what they're called HF radar measurements. It's not really radar, but it's actual real current measurements. These are real data, and it's very impressive. And you have to click this link and learn, oh, click this link, uh, those are, that's going to just open the picture. You click this link and you go learn about this HF radar. If you don't know about that, it's a very impressive. Then once you get zoom in on a field you care about, like if you're over here, do it, or down in California, just zoom in. You go to go to this link. You'll get this map. You click here. You zoom, 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 and then start clicking these. And then once you've clicked these and you get this picture, click this thing called Time History, and then you'll learn. It's got quite amazing, uh, amazing uh, data on currents that are not as well known as might should be. And then here's just a, let's see, that's all, oh, that's just about the end of it. Then the, the question was, how am I going to look at this wind data if I don't have the, you know, some e-chart program or so forth? Then we mentioned that there is, a, this is a popular commercial product. It's like four four hundred dollars or something like that. But there is a very good one even. And then, but there is totally free products. This one, OpenCPN.org, and that's a charting program that shows both the vector charts and the raster charts. Tremendous functionality. It's quite an amazing program. And then it will also download. There's a way to go in there, ask Sail Docs for the wind, and uh, print it out. But to get the HRR data, you're going to have to use the link that's up there, get the win, then just tell this program where you stored it, and then load it, and it'll open it here. So these are the, this is actually some other win because the, the, the yeah, that's some other win. But you can view it in this program, and you can do your route planning and so forth like that. They, they in principle, they have a weather routing routine, but uh, we have not, uh, we have not tested that. And again, another plug for our electronic uh, navigation book on sale for the next week or so. Well, that's a quick go as an experiment. I don't know. It's an experiment on um, presenting a, a longer talk in a shorter time. All the links are online. If you find something of interest there, you can go uh, track it down. I'll be sure to put the link to this, to this main article in it. And that's, uh, that's all I'm doing for now. Thank you.